Welcome to the Startup Grind. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, Startup Grind is an organization designed to help entrepreneurs. Um, our three core values are to give first, help others, and make friends, not only contacts. We, uh, we apply this at our events. We started in 2010 in Silicon Valley, in a garage, literally. And right now we have uh, chapters in 200 cities all over the world, in 85 uh, countries. And we host events like this every month to inspire entrepreneurs by some successful people. Um, how, how we try to help the entrepreneurs is to connect them with some advisors, mentors, or, or corporations, or anything, any meaningful help. Um, all of this would not be possible uh, without our sponsors. So I would like to say a big thank you to Google, who is sponsoring us on the global level under Google for Entrepreneurs. And also locally, they have a really great project called Digital Garage, which, which has a similar uh, aim as us to educate people in digital marketing. So they offer courses offline and online, and you can, you can get your individual study plan, which when you complete, you'll, you get a certificate, and it's all for free. Another uh, uh, project they have is Launchpad, which they started in uh, Central Eastern Europe right now, which is for startups, and all the way from the early idea stage to startups that already raised over $500,000, and this provides them uh, mentoring credits for Google products, uh, up to $50,000 in investment for no equity. So again, it's, it's for free, it's really great. I, I would like to also thank Opera for providing this great venue. Uh, they are still looking for new members, so uh, Hanka in the back, uh, if you want to look around, she, she'll, she'll show you the offices. Um, there are three more things. So first, if you haven't liked us on Facebook, please, please, do, please do it soon. Uh, second, we have a uh, Slido, so you can take out your phones and go to slido.com with the hashtag SGProc, it will be on the, on the screen, and you can ask questions. We, we'll answer those uh, towards the end of the interview. And most importantly, after we are finished with the interview, uh, during the networking, I challenge you to help at least one person tonight, either doing an introduction or giving some advice or giving some feedback. So uh, our guest tonight, Marek, uh, he's an expert on uh, game design and artificial intelligence, and his goal is uh, to help humankind understand the universe better. Please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> So, Marek, um, usually I start with a question uh, about uh, your background, but this time, first I want to ask a different one. Should we be scared of AI? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, I don't think so, uh, but we should be cautious. Like, uh, we should not take it on a light side or like uh, uh, without some, you know, like uh, responsibility. Okay. Uh, when I was preparing myself for the interview, I, I read some articles and I ran across a, a graphic uh, which shows on one axis you have uh, how fast will reach artificial super intelligence. That's on the y axis. And then if it will be positive or negative. Mm -hmm. So where, where do you see yourself on the graph and why? Well, I think I see it in the optimism. But it's important to like uh, mitigate all the risks, you know, that can actually get us to the pessimistic scenario. Uh -huh. So it's not uh, like this optimistic scenario. I think it's not granted. Okay. So like uh, we and like many other people need to work on making sure that it will end up in the optimistic scenario. And what about the time frame? Well, uh, I don't know to be honest, and uh, I tend to think about this like maybe three years, maybe thirty years. Okay. But it's very open. It's a very big see. range. Yeah. And uh, maybe under, another way uh, how to look on this is like uh, as soon as possible, but safely, you know. And, uh, and also like we want to create safe and beneficial AI, uh, but as soon as possible, because uh, as I used to say every day that we don't have this super intelligence or this AGI or any AI, uh, any better AI, we are actually losing a lot of opportunities. 
And uh, one very practical, concrete example could be that, uh, imagine that now, when you got sick, uh, uh, you, are, uh, you will rely on, the, on doctors and their current technology or like knowledge and these things. And uh, so your chances depend exactly on what, how the doctors, like today doctors can help you. And now imagine that in the future, uh, there will be AI or AGI, uh, general AI uh, doctor, Sorry. <laughs> uh, doctor uh, being able to help you and your chances for survival or for uh, getting healthy uh, will be much higher. And uh, so I think it's uh, uh, every day that we don't have this thing, we're actually losing all these opportunities. So I'm looking on this from this perspective. Okay, uh, so this is just for a brief intro to AI. Uh, let's now go back to our classical questions. Can you just tell us your background, where you come from, how did you grow up? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, depending on where I should start. Uh, I'm from Bratislava, from Slovakia, and uh, uh, I started to do programming uh, when I was 14, and uh, before that I was interested in more, I would say, like uh, childish things. Like uh, I used to read a lot of uh, books about Indians, you know, like Vinetu and then all these things, and like these romantic things. So my, when I was younger, my idea was that actually when I grew up, I will be a uh, geodet, which is like a cartographer, okay. and just like old Chatterhand, and I will be like traveling, you know, somewhere helping people and doing the cartography, of course, but like fighting with, you know, bad guys and so on. And so this was before I, I got to computers. And when I got to computers, I realized that uh, it's something that uh, I can uh, like control or I can program, and I can make it do some things that, that I want to do. and. I, I was very interested in this, and I also realized that just like we humans are intelligent, we can also make computers intelligent, like someday in the future. And uh, the question is just the algorithm, like what kind of algorithm is able to learn like humans? And uh, I was thinking about this and like really interested in this because I saw uh, artificial intelligence as the best way, basically, how to solve all the other problems. So how old were you when you, when you got interested in our AI? Uh, this 14 or 15. I mean, I was interested in this even before, but it was just like from sci-fi, you know, books and things. And But with the computer, it became more real because I realized that this is the tool that I can actually use for it. And uh, I was programming and I had two main directions that were interesting for me. One was uh, game programming, like computer graphics, computer physics, you know, like this game related things. And the other was AI. And uh, I decided to, to go uh, mostly after the game thing because I thought that if I want to like sustain my independent, you know, like being independent, and having my own company and so on, I, I uh, saw that I have higher chances to make some money in games and not in, a, in AI at the time, because this was basically 20 years ago. And, uh, and so I had two passions, games or making games and uh, developing AI, so I chose this one. And always uh, I had like, like, a, like a light in my, in my head that when I will make enough money with games, then I will like turn it and continue with AI. And uh, so this happened like after many, many years of trying and everything. And uh, in the meanwhile, I was uh, as a programmer and I uh, uh, was living in Bratislava and I was doing some contract, uh, like programming things. And then uh, uh, actually quite soon, I had some clients from uh, uh, leasing companies in Bratislava. And uh, for them, I was developing some like program, you know, for managing their companies and everything. And uh, so this was basically uh, what was uh, like my job for many years, you know, like supporting this. And in the meanwhile, I was working on uh, game algorithms. I was creating my own uh, game engine. And sometimes I was trying like also some like entrepreneurship things. For example, we open a shop uh, with some stuff in, in Bratislava and like many other things. Like a physical? Yeah, physical shop. Okay. It was actually quite a stupid idea, but, <laughs> but we like uh, tried many things. So did it make a profit or what uh, happened? No, 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 no. Then we closed it. But <laughs> again, it was one of the, the learning experiences, you know, that uh, like you need to get when you want to get somewhere. And, uh, and uh, 
like slowly I was getting to a realization that like why I couldn't uh, at the time, which is let's say like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, why I couldn't make a game. The, the problem was that I had these responsibilities to my clients, so I still had to do you know some software and, and these things. And at the same time, I wanted to uh, be working on the, on games and on these algorithms and things. And uh, it wasn't really working for me, like splitting of splitting attention. And uh, so I realized that I must earn enough money so that I can live just from that money for a couple of years, so I can create a game without like being disturbed or like interrupted, and then really see and see you know like where it go. So I did this, and uh, I started. Uh, I like not started. Basically, I was just continuing to working on this game engine. Uh, back then, it was about a game called Minor Wars, and uh, I was working on this myself. I was doing programming, graphics, sound design, game design, PR, and like all these things, which actually I think is very good because you actually get to realize, like, or you get to learn all these different aspects, and they are very much interrelated. So it's it's very useful. And uh, then I released like something like a demo of that game, mm -hmm. and uh, some people buy it. So it generated, I don't know, maybe like 50,000 euro or something like this. So, like in that moment, it was quite a lot of money for me. So I knew that okay, with this I can continue. Plus, there was this market validation, so I knew that there are some people who want to play this particular game. So I was continuing work working on this, uh, and in the meanwhile, I uh, or some people on the internet, some volunteers, some fans. They wanted to join my team and work uh, on this game with me. So they joined the team. They didn't work on the game with me. <laughs> they just took my time. But uh, like at least for like small moment, I had a feeling that I have a team. So they are not the company right now? No, 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 of course not. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, the thing is that there are people who just want to create games. And then there are people who actually create games. And those are like very different groups. And uh, so uh, I was like still working on the game, like adding one thing after another. And in, in the time, I was also thinking that uh, if I want to make this bigger, like bigger game, I probably need more money so I can hire some people and, uh, and so on. So I started to look for investment because I need more money that I had uh, saved in bank. And uh, I was also like considering the other options that I will just do it myself because that was also an option. Like, uh, just the thing, uh, there were basically two reasons why I didn't decide to continue myself. One was that uh, I thought that with more people it will be richer, like the game will be better. And the other thing we, will be that uh, by getting the investors and getting some bigger team, I will get to like a new level of problems, if you think about it this way, that I can learn on, you know, and then I can actually reuse it later. Because usually you don't have companies that are made just from one person. So uh, if you ha want to learn how to like uh, manage or lead many other people and go through all these struggles and everything, it's better like to, to really have this, this experience. So I, I started to look for investors, uh, mostly I think in Czech and Slovakia. And uh, so this was still for the game startup. Yeah, yeah this was okay. for the game startup. And I think it was like seven, eight years ago or something like that. And uh, actually quite soon I found one, uh, let's call it like investors who were uh, willing to invest into this. Uh, so we signed contracts after some time. And it was actually quite fast, all these things. And uh, then I, uh, started to hire people for this. Uh, so you basically got the investment while you were still just alone. The company was you. Uh, yes, yes, I think. And uh, so I started to uh, hire people, like more programmers, more artists, and so on. And uh, we were like fighting to finish the game and release it. And uh, this was still a minor wars uh, game. And uh, we were operating in this mode for about one and a half year. Uh, it was also quite challenging because the investors, there were some like struggles on their side. So uh, with financing, it wasn't that easy and so on. And, uh, and also the people for the team, they were like mostly very young and inexperienced. So it was like very hard to get actual some work from them. But uh, with uh, uh, like a lot of effort uh, and with smaller team because we had to decrease it because there were not uh, finances. We finished the, the game, released it, but it wasn't a big success. Like it made some money, it basically covered the costs, but it wasn't a huge success. And at that moment, uh, now I need to remember what I was thinking, but... It seems like you were back at the beginning with no money again. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. 
But, but basically, yes. <laughs> but what I had was the experience and uh, in different things, you know, because I already tried. And I spent quite some time actually like consolidating my experience and thinking about what went wrong, what went uh, like good, bad and so on. And uh, I spent maybe a few months thinking about this and uh, I still had few people actually like three colleagues in my company at the moment because I didn't have more money like for more people. And this was actually one of the best things because it uh, forced me to downscale the company and to keep only the most relevant people, like the people who were actually adding the value. Like I don't want to say that the other people who didn't make it uh, are bad, like, uh, but many of them are. So it's this basically pushed me to really have their just uh, like top people. It's interesting, uh, we had uh, Vinod Kosla at the global conference uh, in February and he was saying that uh, for startups it's better if they have less money than more because it forces you to think more, much harder about the problems yeah. and come up with the better solutions. This is one thing and then also uh, with more people there is more distraction and uh, it's also harder to control or manage uh, more people and especially if you don't know them well. You know, like One thing is if you have more people and you have been working together for years so you know each other and you as a leader know who you can delegate to and how much and so on, but if it is new people, it's very hard. And usually it's, in my opinion, in my experience, it's uh, usually just mistake, you know, like it's better to not do it at all. And, uh, and so with these uh, three colleagues, uh, we are like still working on our engine and I was thinking about what should be the next game. And like obviously uh, it was still in, uh, in the lines of my original vision where I wanted to create a game which will be a, uh, like a Lego in a space or just Lego where you can build stuff. This stuff has some physics, like some engines and it's engineering game. And so you can build and then fly with these things or crash them. And the physical engine will calculate all these deformations and everything and, and so on. So just like when uh, we were kids and we were playing with Lego Technic, you know, and you have to build something that actually works and operates and does something. I wanted the same experience for the games. And so we are thinking about this and I, I was also like thinking about how to do it like really good this time without all those like mistakes and okay. you know wrong directions and all these things. And having a really small team, I think very much to help in this because, uh, as I said, like it's much easier to direct or manage few people than many people because then you cannot interact with them every day and get them on the on the on the line where you want them and so on. And uh, so I was thinking about this original vision and how to incorporate it to our situation that was there and how to continue from there. And we started to evolving the engine one thing after another. And because there were only so few people, I had enough time to plan everything and like really think about every little step that we have to do, which was very good for me because I really had a like, very good understanding of uh, of every detail in our game, in our strategy, in our PR, in our business plan and everything. Like there was not something that wasn't like designed by me. So this was good. And uh, we also knew that we have money only for maybe like a half a year, or one and a half or something like this. And so we had to set very strict deadlines so that even if our first release will not of this game, of this new game, will not be a super successful, then at least we can like try second time or like fix something and continue and iterate and so on. Uh, and uh, so we set a deadline, we said that we must release the game in seven months. So we set a deadline and uh, basically I started to backtrack like w from that date, like what needs to be on the release day, what needs to be like week before, week before and so on. And uh, I also ordered things by priority and also by something like a risk that the most risky but important things, we started to work on them right away. Mm -hmm. And the less important things we left for, for later. Uh, so they could be, uh, or like, if we wouldn't have enough time, we can just leave them out, you know, and nothing bad would happen. And uh, uh, basically it was this risk management kind of thing. And uh, yeah, then we work on the game, uh, prepared, prepared it, release it, and it was very successful on the, first day, actually even before, because we made something like, we called it early access to the early access, and we released the game on our eShop for one hour, I think. <laughs> and it made like probably a few million crowns, you know, just in that one hour. And then we released it for 24 hours, because we actually realized that one hour works only for people in certain time zone, but 
people in Australia, they were sleeping yeah. during these hours, so they couldn't <laughs> buy and they were unhappy. So we, uh, we opened it for 24 hours and it also made a lot of money. And then we were waiting for the like, big, big launch. And the reason for doing it this way that we have these unofficial launches before the official launch was to test it and fix before the, the big thing. So uh, this was the strategy and we launched the game. It became successful and basically we are still developing and like improving the game uh, since then, last three and a half year. Okay, and so then you made enough money from the games uh, to, to work on the artificial intelligence, which, is where, which was your second passion. Um, you basically funded uh, Good AI um, three years ago in January, I think, 2014. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what has been the progress? You, you released the roadmap last year. How far are you on your goal? Um, okay, so uh, uh, we or I started uh, Good AI in January 2014, as you said, and uh, or maybe what was the initial goal? You know, why did you do it, and then how did it go? It was continuation of this lifelong dream of building human-level AI, and uh, it was like. I wasn't really thinking about this much. It was like, okay, now I have you know, like this enough money to step on this uh, next thing. So I just started to, to do this. But I was also thinking like how to do it right because I uh, didn't know what is the right strategy. Like should be the right strategy, start programming the AI myself or again, hire a team or maybe like go to conferences and learn about how other people are trying to do it. So there are many different uh, directions that I could choose. But you already had some some knowledge of the I know. AI, right? Uh, yes, 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 I had. And uh, <laughs> but still, uh, I was assuming that there may be a lot of things that I just don't know. You know, that are like outside of my radar. So I, uh, at that moment, I said that it will be better to start exploring. You know, and uh, and then like exploiting, like using what I already have, or like what I found. And so in this stage, I started to hire a few people for this team slowly. For example, one of the questions was that, what is the right profile for a candidate for, for a job in good AI? Because I was also not sure about this. Like, should it be a guy who is, uh, for example, who never went to university and is just like some smart person? Or should it be a person with like many degrees and everything? Uh, should it be like creative person or more like a systematic person? And there are many questions like this. And uh, so I chose like many different paths that I had to like uh, explore and, and uh, understand what is what is behind. And since then, uh, uh, we grew to about 20 people in Good AI, and uh, we released a few roadmaps, or like let's say one roadmap, uh, which covers uh, the steps that we need to solve in order to get to this uh, general human level AI. Uh, and I would like uh, say that there are two big steps. One is uh, building the architecture or like AI architecture that can learn in a gradual way, plus like many other things. And the other is what we call school for AI or like mm -hmm. a curric curriculum or learning tasks where this AI will learn right and beneficial skills and so on. And uh, the other thing that we uh, also did was, and we did it rec recently, uh, we started general AI challenge where we put uh, quite a lot of money as like this big package of, of prices, actually five million dollars. And uh, a month ago we launched a uh, first round, which is called the gradual learning round. And this one is focused on, I will like try to explain, but basically it's about uh, programming an AI that can learn in a gradual way, which means that as it learns something, is it, able, it, it is able to reuse this new skill for learning another skill more efficiently. So it's not for every new task, it's not starting from like point zero, but it's already reusing. So basically it's accumulating all these skills and this knowledge. And this is very important because it makes the learning more efficient because as you learn more and more, every new task is easier and easier for you. So for us, this gradual learning is a fundamental thing. So we started uh, this gradual learning round a uh, month, month ago. Uh, and, uh, today we have more than 300 participants in this challenge. And, but we will see, of course, how the results will look like. Uh, we have had a uh, few meetups around the world. Uh, there was one in Bratislava, Prague, New York and Tokyo, which is interesting that with our partners we were able to manage this. 
and uh, we are planning more rounds. And uh, so when do you expect to see the first results? Uh, there is deadline, and uh, it is it was for six months, so it will end up in in five months. Then there will be one month of evaluation. So people will send us these agents, you know, the programs, which should be trained. Uh, we'll run them on evaluation tasks in our environment, and then we'll see which one solves it in the best way. And mm -hmm. basically here the thing is that we'll be measuring if these agents are really learning gradually uh, by, again, I don't want to go to details, but we'll compare them with some other agents that don't learn gradually and see the difference. How so, fast, how fast they And also, also how fast, which means that the agent that can go through all these tasks that we have there, a uh, fastest is uh, demonstrating, it's not a proof, but it's demonstrating that it's probably using gradual learning because uh, it's able to solve these tasks faster because it's reusing the skills. And for example, there are in this, uh, uh, in this task, task set, there are some tasks that are so hard to solve if you don't have the previous experience, so it's practically impossible. It's just like, uh, imagine that you would have to uh, so did you come up with this task? These are basically yes, yes, the criteria, yes. yeah, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. We have this task and actually this was uh, another benefit of uh, having this challenge that it forced us, like our team, to come up with these gradual tasks because we were working on this for uh, one and a half year, I would say, and uh, we're working on tasks that will actually uh, show that, or that will actually uh, f uh, be really good tasks for learning and then testing this uh, graduality. And uh, the tasks that we have are, I think, very nice. They are uh, like, they look like some um, language problems or like uh, it is some kind of a text communication with the agent or agent and the environment. But uh, in reality, it's... Is it, is it like the Turing test, something similar? No, uh, Turing test is about like making or like fooling the these judges, you know, that uh, they will think that you are, uh, or they will it, think it's that... All, but it's also like communication. Basically. Yes, yes, yes. And also uh, our our uh, ta uh, our round is about communication between agent and the environment. So it's like uh, environment asks something, the agent, the agent answers, and the environment gives reward or punishment. And then it repeats. And uh, the goal of the agent is to solve all the tasks as fast as possible. So. Uh, when it solves some task, the environment starts giving him new task. And then when it solves it, it will give him new task. But it takes some time until the agent actually adapts or learns uh, how to solve this new task. Because you need to, even as a human, like, for example, when we try these tasks on people, it also takes them some time until they understand what actually they should do. And uh, we can also see this graduality that when you learn task number one, two, three, five, and then there is task number six, and it is reusing some of the things that you learn in one, two, three, four, you solve this task number six much faster than if you just started on task number six. You know, it's just like, for me, it's uh, much easier to read a book today, for example, than uh, it was for me when I was just like two weeks old. You know, like when I was two weeks old, it was impossible for me to read a book. Like maybe I tried, maybe <laughs> I don't know, but it was impossible definitely, but now it's easy. So, so, so maybe the simplest definition of good AI is you, you are trying to reverse engineer the human brain, right? Is, a is little bit. We, I would just say that we are taking inspiration from some of the mechanisms that are in human brain, but not like really, uh, really uh, reverse engineering it. And uh, so I think uh, human brain is just an inspiration for us uh, and for some of the things. I think that. Uh, it's actually easier to think about or like uh, what we are trying to build is artificial intelligence. So uh, I, I should define what is intelligence or like what we understand, uh, how we understand intelligence. So for us, intelligence is a to tool for searching for solutions to problems. And okay, again, this is maybe vague, but uh, it's, uh, uh, it's something that is uh, adapting uh, for, learns from experience. Yeah, learns right. from experience and learns all these different uh, shortcuts and heuristics how to actually narrow and shorten the search for the solutions. So, so this, this makes it different from evolution, which is basically just blindly trying. Yes, but even evolution you can, you can uh, see as a, one of the search algorithms because it's also searching. Maybe the, there is no explicit objective that the evolution is trying to achieve, you know, somewhere in the future, but 
uh, there is some kind of objective, like uh, we can say that uh, evolution is like uh, maximizing something or like promoting something in the environment. And something like this can be also intelligent. So the, the, the fact that if there is goal or not, uh, it's either important, but maybe not that much. So uh, again, for us, uh, if intelligence is a search problem or like intelligence is solving the search problem, then when you want to search for something, you need to narrow the search space and you need to be able to jump or like navigate in this possible solutions, possible hypothesis space uh, faster, more efficiently, uh, through more plausible paths and so on. And you can do this by learning and also by learning how to learn or learning how to exploit different uh, structures mm -hmm. in this environment. And uh, we as people are doing, uh, doing many of these things. And that's why I think it's very good to, to use people or like look on people as an inspiration. But we can do it, I think, even without all those complexities that are in people. So, so what are the biggest obstacles that you have right now? Uh, one of them is to solve this gradual learning. And uh, for this, uh, in, in our team, we have few, uh, few like sub teams and uh, we are working on different architectures. Uh, each team is trying to tackle it from a slightly different angle. And these architectures, they should be able to learn gradually. So uh, when they will be presented with some problem, they will uh, try some uh, hypothesis, some, some ways how to solve it. And they should learn from this, uh, acquire these skills that they learned and reuse them for solving the next task. And they should continuously uh, cont uh, continue in this. So, so, so what you do is your teams basically try to build these different approaches and then you test wh which one works and then you develop that one further, right? Yes, yes, yes. That's basically the plan. And uh, I think that when we'll solve this gradual learning, many other things will, uh, will go, go faster. Because, for example, we'll be able to teach the, this AI something, for example, communication with us, even very simple communication, but we will be able to use this communication to, to teach it some other things more efficiently. Because right now when you're teaching AI, basically what you are doing is that you are showing it some, uh, some examples and telling it, depending on the scenario, but telling it like, uh, for example, this is Apple, this is not Apple, and, and so on. And the AI will try to come up with some hypothesis uh, that can explain that the reasons why you think this is this and this is that. And these things are encoded in these neural networks that people are talking about. But in principle, this is it. Like the AI is coming up with this hypothesis and then uh, using the examples to basically cut and say that, okay, this, is, uh, this belongs to this category because of these reasons and this belongs to these reasons. And uh, it's also possible to get this wrong. And uh, there could be actually much better ways how to teach someone something, you know, because, for example, when... Yeah, different than we as humans have, right? Or... Uh, we humans actually use different methods of learning that, for example, when I was learning uh, as a child, uh, what is uh, apple and, I don't know, like some banana and some other things, uh, I didn't see, I didn't need to see millions of examples of these things. Uh, I maybe saw like few examples, and uh, maybe I made wrong categorization, but some, somehow corrected me, maybe explained why this is not this thing, and it used like much richer communication than just some error signal or something like this. So uh, this is why I think that uh, if you have a system that can learn gradually, we can teach it useful skills and then build other skills on top of these skills and basically make, uh, make all this, uh, this process exponentially faster. So uh, gradual learning, but there are many other smaller things like behind this gradual learning as well. So this all sounds uh, very interesting, but uh, it's very different from, uh, you, you know, there is AI everywhere now. Every startup says they are using AI for sales or marketing or, uh, you know, controlling the temperature in your house or whatever. But that's very different from what you do. Mm -hmm. So the distinction, just, just to explain, that's narrow AI, right? That is mm -hmm. focused on just one single task and is not learning outside of that domain. And what you are working on is general AI, which could be later applied also to the problem solved by the narrow AI, right? Uh, yes, definitely. So what's going to happen to all these startups, you know, that are working on their own kind of weak AI uh, solutions once, once you or somebody else working on uh, general AI has been successful? Mm, depending on like if the, the company that will have this uh, general AI solution, 
if uh, they will want to share it with others. Maybe they will want to share it uh, as some kind of library or tool or something like this. And in that case, I think uh, the other startups will be able to, to use it. You know? So uh, there is not a problem. Uh, I think there will be actually bigger uh, changes in the society where this human level general AI will come, I think, bigger than few startups. Okay, so uh, of course it will affect uh, education or our health systems or uh, basically everything, but um, maybe general AI will be not itself the big change, but if it can keep on learning and learning faster, and it will become a, like a, a artificial super intelligence that's when it becomes more intelligent than humans this is this is the scary stuff so uh, uh, how do you want to ensure that it actually will be beneficial to us mm -hmm. I think there is also very important the uh, question of control because the world is full of bad guys so how do you make sure you know that um, some terrorists don't use it for something. So, so this is a good question, and uh, uh, the answer is that through uh, proper training or like through this school for AI. So, uh, one of the things is uh, that we need to like solve very well is that the AI will understand this world in the same way as we do. So, there will not be some kind of catastrophic misunderstandings, you know. So that the, when the AI will see uh, a glass a table, it will not identify these things as something completely different than as a human. Like, for example, maybe it will see it just like some atoms, so it will, you know, like, we don't want this. We really want to, uh, to uh, for this AI to understand the world through the same kind of patterns as, as we, as humans. So this is one of the things. And the other is to teach it and in some way, like, positively bias its behavior in directions that are beneficial and safe for us. This is very important. It's like when you are teaching a dog or child some things, mm -hmm. uh, you want to positively bias it to be like good, you know, do, doing good things. You don't want, uh, you want to basically limit it in certain way so it will not start doing the bad things. And so for this, uh, we will need to have the school where we will, through the training, teach the AI what is right, what is wrong, and then teach it to do the right things. And uh, we need, or we, or anyone who will want to do general AI, uh, will need to do this before this system will become available to, to other people. I think this is very important because when you will have AI that uh, is accessible even to a terrorist, but uh, is already biased to be good, uh, then uh, the terrorist will not be able to convert it, to convert it uh, and to start doing some, some bad things. Of course, like I'm simplifying because maybe he can hack it or something yeah. like this, but still the AI will try to prevent this. It's just like, for example, I, uh, through my education and everything, I was biased to not want to kill people. And if some terrorist will come to me and will tell me like, Marek, please change something in your brain and you will start killing people, then I will also like resist. I will not want you know, this change. So uh, I see it very similar in the, in the AI. And now the question is like, what are the good things and bad things? And of course, this is very subjective. Like what is good for us may be bad for you know, people uh, with some different culture and, and vice versa. And even there can be differences between us. So uh, it's hard to answer. And uh, my, uh, my answer to this is that uh, showing it or like, how we will solve it is that uh, we will choose some positive examples or some examples of positive behavior of good people and then we'll show this to, to the AI and then we'll bias its education to like take this as inspiration or like take this as uh, how it should understand and approximate somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think uh, that there can be, uh, there can be uh, like 100% certain rules some logical rules for ethics and morality and all these things, because even we as people cannot say about certain situations that I think this is the best way how to solve this, because sometimes yes, it's some... Different cultures will solve it differently. Yes, and also we as like, for example, when we have these trolley problems, like if the car should hit yeah. these people or these people, uh, even me, and it's just me, I, uh, I'm not even like two cultures, I'm just one one person uh, cannot say that this is right or this is, it, this is not like, I'm like, I don't know, like maybe this, maybe this, maybe nobody. So uh, 
uh, it's hard. And so I think even the, the AI uh, would be uh, like doing these approximations. And if it will have enough examples uh, and enough communication with us, then we can uh, can say or we can get certain um, certain like um, belief that the system will act in the way that is beneficial for us, but we'll like we'll never be hundred percent sure. Maybe after a lot of testing, a lot of simulations, but I think we'll never be hundred percent sure. Just like uh, you cannot be hundred percent sure, sure about some person that he will do something as you are like expecting him, because you have always some model about something, some some other person or some system or something like this, but this model is never like 100% copy of the actual system. And for example, maybe this is a different topic, but uh, one of the things that uh, European Union, uh, they, like, a month ago or two months ago, they were discussing some like uh, regulations in AI and robotics and all these things. And one of the things very important was that there should be uh, the manufacturers of robots and AI should, should really make it very clear uh, what will the robot or the AI do in different situations. And these rules should be very, uh, like, So not, not did they define some, you know, general situations that you have to say, like? Uh, uh, they, they said it more like that uh, the manufacturer should really uh, explain what this robot will do in certain situations. And uh, it must be, like, put in a way that will not confuse the customers or the consumers. And uh, I will tell you one example. It can be, for example, self-driving cars. Like, uh, imagine that uh, the self-driving car, you are sitting there, the self-driving car is driving you through the city. And uh, if you don't know exactly the model that the car is using for doing its actions or like for the behavior, then you will expect it to do in some situation something different than the car will actually do. Like, for example, and actually there was some, some example in, in the media that uh, uh, some car company was testing their self-driving car and it was quite slow and like very safe. Like they said, they actually called like a, your grandma, you know, driving mm -hmm. a car. So it stopped like everywhere, let people go, you know, and like it was super safe. And uh, it was even getting to situations like when there were some pedestrians uh, near the road, it stopped, you know, because it was assuming like maybe they will walk in or something like this. But a normal person or like normal driver, human right. driver would not stop because he will know that in these situations people don't do it and he can drive. And then there was some other company, and it was quite aggressive that the car was just the, the car was just like driving and very fast and and everything. And the thing is that you, as a buyer of this car, like how would you know the model of how this car will make decisions in different situations? And even if you learn how it behaves in certain situations, it can still or like your generalization, your predictions about what the car will do in different situations that are like outside of the range of situations that you experience mm -hmm. it uh, will be different and you will be surprised. And if you are just surprised, that can be maybe only affecting your like comfort with the car because, for example, the car will start slowing down in a situation where you are not expecting to slow it down. So you're like, what's happening? Uh, but, uh, for example, if uh, uh, you will be expecting that the car some some semi uh, like uh, not fully fully autonomous self-driving car but like something in between if you will expect that the car will for example be okay driving in streets and everything but in reality the car will like shut down its self-driving system and let you drive the, the situation in uh, let you drive the car in a situation where you are not expecting that this will mm -hmm. happen and for example you are talking to to other passengers or something like this that can be dangerous and this regulation there were many other regulations, but this one, uh, I'm actually not sure if it passed or not, but at least it's the, like the idea. Uh, this regulation would be about forcing the manufacturers to make sure that the AI or the model of its behavior is explainable and explained to customers in a way uh, with like so, least amount so they of know what confusion. To expect, exactly. Yeah, and I think this is very important. And with more intelligent systems and more complex system, it will be even more more uh, important, so that you are not surprised by what the robot or the AI is doing. Yeah, uh, I just have one note to the thing that you were saying before about uh, teaching teaching the AI 
uh, and then basically the model of punishing if it does something wrong and biasing it towards the good outcomes for us. That uh, it seems pretty important that you have to do this before it surpasses us. Because even if in our society it works like that, we are the most intelligent species. We are basically equal between others, between us. So uh, if, if you do something wrong, you are punished. But the question is if you will still be able to punish something that's, you know, 1,000 times more intelligent than you are. But I think that that, that will be a very, <laughs> very long discussion. Uh, yeah, so this is important to, to, uh, to bias it before it becomes more intelligent. And, uh, but maybe we don't even need to go to a level where it will be more intelligent than us, because maybe even if you will think that you can control it, it will be a complex system that is ad adapting itself and even adapting the way it is adapting itself. So you cannot think past few iterations of its development. And uh, like we are also trying to develop systems that are, we call it like recursively self-improving, which means that it's a thing that improves itself and this improved version will improve itself and it will continue like this. And uh, a system like this is, it has some properties which will make it impossible to predict after a few iterations. And uh, like no matter if we are talking about AI or any other system like so economy. You will have problem with the EU because you will not be able to predict. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, but I think we don't need to let it go like this far that maybe it will be more, more safe uh, to develop AI that is more or less on our level of intelligence and then use it to develop technologies or use it to develop uh, even uh, safety methods, how to continue on this recursive self-improvement level in a safe way. And to have like a cap, cap on the level uh, of... I think there will never be cap, okay. but maybe to, to develop ways uh, how to make it safe, you know, because maybe like really making it steps like 100 iterations later is impossible with our human intelligence. But if you will use uh, this, uh, AI, this still human level AI, to make sm you smarter and then this smarter you can think about ways how to make the next level of AI which will be still safe and then you can basically be augmenting each other and improving each other continuously without the cup and forever but it still like should be safe at least like it it so appears let's safe. hope that the humans will be able to keep up with the yes 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 AI. and <laughs> i would actually think about the ai not like a different entity or like a different species but really just a tool that is augmenting augmenting our natural intelligence like i i just like glasses or like a car or like clothes or something like this so it's just something that you are using but like you are it doesn't have its own agency, it doesn't have its own goals, you are setting the goals. And I think it will be different level maybe, but uh, with these AIs, that the AI is just a tool and it doesn't have any other purpose than to do what you want it to do. Of course, this can change when the AI will need to do some more autonomous tasks and so on, but, but we are creating a tool that will make our lives better. Like we don't want to create a new species or like a new society or something like this. And I think it's even for me and for people around me, it this like this future where we have AI and the AI is making us smarter and us smarter us is making smarter AI and it goes like this. So we are still smarter and we are still controlling it. Uh, this future looks like better than the future where we stay as humans with our, let's say like stupid intelligence when you compare it with this AI and the AI will be growing and getting more and more intelligent and we still will be with, within our like human limits. That doesn't sound good to me. Okay, so, so what are some practical applications that you have already achieved? That, so do you have uh, some project that you worked on with the private or public sector? Mm -hmm. So uh, about a uh, few months ago, we started a sister company called Good, uh, Good AI Applied. And uh, here we are applying uh, some of the, with our, within our clients, we are applying uh, some of the prototypes that we develop. Uh, luckily, it is actually going like much better than I was expecting that the, the clients are, are very uh, interested in this. And we have few of them. And 
uh, mostly it's things that I would consider, at this moment, I would consider like a narrow AI, you know, because we still don't have the general AI. But with our expertise in general AI, I think soon we will have some kind of edge or some kind of advantage that we will have tools and skills, especially skills that will help us to solve uh, tasks that narrow AI cannot do. And uh, what are these tasks? Uh, because today, like current AI and also other AIs are, have their limits uh, with uh, what they can learn and what they can solve. Uh, we need to uh, look for tasks that this AI can either automate or augment or like create uh, where these limits are still okay. So basically we need to be looking for these low hanging fruits mm -hmm. that uh, you can achieve or like you can reach with current AI. Uh, we shouldn't be looking for the fruits that are like above, you know, that are too far for the capabilities of today AI. And uh, I think this is something where people may be surprised, like some of the things may look easy to automate with today AI, but actually they are super hard. And then there can be some other things that are, uh, are easy to automate, like uh, with AI today. And uh, so for example, uh, we have clients from different uh, fields, and uh, I can think about one project where, um, I, I, again, I cannot mention the, the clients and talk about uh, these things, but it's about uh, there is some, some products and they may have some kind of like damages, and this AI is looking into these patterns in these pictures and looking for the damages or what is like correct, what is not correct, and then reporting this to people. And this uh, thing uh, can automate, you know, this process, so uh, they can uh, see through more more examples and and so on. And uh, then there are some examples with communication agents, where uh, a company has a customers and they want to communicate with the company, and they are using this AI augmented communication to actually like uh, to actually like move a lot of this communication from humans to AI answering the questions and so on. And then there can be some other uh, other uh, applications where you have, for example, a, a big factory and there is a lot of sensors and people and everything. And the AI is learning how to optimize the processes in this in this factory to decrease the cost or increase the or not not increase actually like decrease the time or uh, energy consumption or or anything like this. So uh, these are all the, the other applications. Okay, so we have some questions from. Uh the audience, are you in touch with OpenAI and Elon Musk? Or what do you think about them? I was actually going to ask this as well. How, how do you compare with OpenAI? Uh, uh, we are in touch with them a little bit, like we know each other. And uh, 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 they are doing some interesting stuff. I think they are more, uh, more oriented towards some short term. Uh, solutions and short-term AI algorithms than we are. Like I think we are like still much more interested in general AI. But what they are releasing and uh, like the work they are releasing is interesting, and also the people that are working there are interesting. But I think that the difference between us is that at least when I'm not talking about the good AI applied, you know, this business side, but good AI core, we are interested in like really just the general AI. So we are like targeting there. So that's I think the main difference. And I think the common core is that you both are on the side that, you know, the cautious, we need to develop systems that will be safe for the people. Yes, yes. But I think uh, even other companies that are working on either narrow or general AI are thinking about this because nobody wants to create something that will, uh, like, destroy him or the other people, but also uh, there is the other thing that uh, you also don't want the other company to develop something that will destroy you. So it's like this game theory thing. Okay. Uh, what's your take on uh, universal basic income? Would you support it and what impact do you think it could have on humanity? Because AI can take uh, you know, the jobs of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. so. I, I think, uh, like I'm not sure, but I think it may be one of the solutions how to solve this in a moment in the future where uh, the AI will really take all the jobs and the AI will do the jobs. Uh, better than people and I don't really see this like taking the job it's more like the AI will start doing the stuff that so that people don't need to do that stuff 
It's just like one example that I use is that, for example, sun is generating, you know, like energy for us. So it's some kind of engine, you know, like some kind of factory for the energy. And we are not paying money uh, to the sun. It's just doing this thing for mm. us and we are just consuming it. And uh, then you can look into nature and see many different factories, you know, like something is generating oxygen, something is generating all the all the food or like, you know, these things. And uh, and uh, we don't need to pay for it. So it can be very similar. There can be this AGI or these AGIs doing stuff for people so that people don't need to do it. They can just have fun and leisure and so on. Sounds good. <laughs> yes, and, uh, but on the other side, like uh, what then will be the purpose of the people? You know? And I think that actually people uh, should be looking or then when this happens, should be looking for a new purpose in their lives. Because just sitting all day playing games or, you know, like doing nothing, uh, I don't think that's like uh, something many people would be actually satisfied for a long time, maybe for a while, but not for a long time. And so I actually think that there will be many uh, changes in the society. And uh, But I also think that there will be people who will always be looking forward and using, for example, this AI to augment themselves and go on space exploration or scientific exploration, and they will just continue in this. And there will be people who will just want to uh, have fun and do nothing. And I, I also think it's okay that there is enough resources, you know, in the universe to, to support this all. So, but I don't know exactly how this will work out. And maybe the universal basic income will need to come uh, for the for the, uh, like, let's say, safety reasons. Because uh, imagine that um, like m many people, or like almost all people on this planet will be without job, because nobody will want them, because they will have robots to, to create this stuff. And these people, uh, if they don't have jobs, they don't have money, and they are upset, you know, and they will go and start uh, rebelling and, and so on. So even for these owners of the robot, it may be actually safer to give some money in the form of universal basic income. On the other side, uh, it would be actually nice to see some economic simulation uh, that will show up like what will happen in the next step because uh, these people who will own the capitalist, let's say, who will own the robots and these robotic factories will be creating stuff, but uh, who, where they will be selling this stuff if the people will not have money and uh, the people who have robots and AI, they can build whatever they want. They like suddenly they don't need the people to, to buy it or to, to build it. So it's like in capitalism, you have capital, labor, you know, and consumers are like... So the labor goes out of the yeah, picture. Yeah. And also the consumers in certain way, because like you have robots, you know, so they can, they can uh, build anything for you. So this is another like step that uh, will be interesting. And... Uh, yeah. What about education? So... Is it worth, so if I, if I would go to university now, should I, is, is it worth it to start learning, uh, for example, about AI, machine learning, or is it too late? I think it's still worth it. Okay. Like, it's not too late. And, uh, and, uh, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, what was your biggest fuck up? <laughs> uh, probably many. And uh, I think many. And uh, uh, it depends on like from what angle I'm looking on this. So uh, some of the fuck ups could be that, uh, for example, when we're releasing this game that I was talking about, maybe we should have done the, this first game, not the space engineers that, that became successful, but the game before. Maybe we should have done the PR differently, like control the message in a, in a different way and so on. So the things would uh, like uh, happen in a dif different way. And uh, uh, like to communicate with the community that we had in, in a different way. And, uh, but when I'm thinking, for example, what kind of fuck ups I'm doing, like even now, like for example, what kind of fuck up did I today, yesterday, you know, last week, last month and so on. I think, uh, yeah, I think it kind of doesn't matter. Like, if you have, uh, if you have some like uh, unsuccessful things or some fuck ups or some mistakes, but uh, in average uh, they are less costly than what you are getting on the profit side, 
you know, then by it's the experience, okay. Right? But, uh, by experience or by like having something. So it's like, I think a failure is only only when you stop trying. But it's also important to know that uh, uh, like you are failing until you start succeeding. This is very important. But it's also important to know that what are the costs of these little failures? Because if one of these failures will kill you, then you cannot try again. But if this uh, cost of the failure is, is low, so that you can try again and try again and try again, and you know that you will persevere, then you, you can say that uh, in the end you will get to the success. And if the, the volume of the success will be bigger than the volume mm -hmm. of this of these failures, then you are still a winner, you know, because only the difference is important. So even the fuck ups, I like, I try to make them as few as possible because they cost something always, but uh, I wouldn't be worried about this. I think only what is important is this difference. Okay. Uh, what is your current thinking about making sure artificial superintelligence will be good and beneficial to human humanity? How to teach it moral and ethical principles? So uh, this goes back to this school for AI and teaching and, and so on. So uh, one part of that answer could be that first bias the AI in a direction that it will actually listen to you and will be biased to do things that you want it to do. And then, for example, teach it some positive uh, moral examples of some people. And you can do this by uh, showing it, for example, stories where there are some good people, some good characters, then showing it examples with people that are bad and biasing it that do these things and don't do these things. So you can even use the bad guys for something good. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, what is the difference between your company and Google DeepMind or different? Uh, in which ways do you have an edge? Uh, so uh, we are working on similar things. Uh, they are also working on general AI and uh, they are much bigger. I think at this moment they have 400 or maybe 500 uh, people where we are just 20. So that's one difference. But you have them all over the world in the general AI challenge, right? Yeah, that's true. That's one of the ways how uh, like uh, even if someone is bigger than you, then uh, if you don't play like by the rules, you can find a different edge or like different angle. And so, yeah, general AI challenge is one of the answers. Uh, the other is maybe a, a much uh, stronger focus on this general AI and not on the on the local things. Maybe uh, having a better or like, I don't want to say like we have better because definitely these guys are also very good and, and trying to do their things and they have nicer results. Uh, but uh, 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 if you look around and see uh, successful companies, they usually didn't start inside a big company, you know, so this can be one part of the answer that even Google didn't start inside Microsoft. Google started as two guys, you know, doing something and you can f see this like almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, we still have chance and uh, as I said like before, uh, if you don't stop trying, then you always have a chance to do something. But yeah, uh, for practical purposes, it's also good to see uh, where we can be faster, for example, uh, developing this general AI. So we are looking into this and uh, I think we have good team and uh, good roadmap, so maybe this can be our edge, but we will see this only at the end. And maybe another way how to look on this is that maybe we don't even need to be sure or like, well, maybe the, the question is not about if uh, these big companies are better than us or not, but it's like we also want to develop general AI, and if they, don't, uh, they de do develop general AI and don't share it with us, then like... Then you still have to keep working, right? Yeah, exactly. So uh, we don't need to be the first, we just need to develop general AI. That's our goal. Okay. Um... Regarding tech and algorithms, do you see the future in neural networks, uh, AI nowadays? What are other approaches you will explore? Uh, so, uh, in our team, we we have some neural network based uh, things, and uh, then we have, I think, more things that are not what someone would consider neural networks. But uh, this is really uh, more a question what someone considers to be a neural network. And, uh, and or how you define it and so on. And uh, because it looks like or it appears that what we try to achieve uh, is create a system that is made of many 
independent agents that are connected together somehow in a network. So it's a some network. Uh, you can you can view this as a network of of many agents communicating to each other. And if you call it neural network or something else, it's it's just a detail. Uh, the detail or the main thing is that what kind of communication is there? Uh, what kind of interface is there between these agent these these neurons? And this is where I would say uh, what we are doing is different from the mainstream neural network way of thinking. But I, I really must emphasize that just the mainstream, because uh, there are many people who are also doing uh, the research. And they would say that they are doing neural networks, but some people would not consider it, and so on. So I don't want to confuse you with this thing. So for example, one main difference uh, that we have is that we much we put a lot of focus on growing of these neural networks because currently uh, the mainstream is that you have some fixed topology of the network and then you are just training the connections between these neurons. In our approach, it's by growing and as it grows, it can reuse previous, uh, previous parts of the network and compose like bigger parts of the network, reuse the skills and so on. So uh, the growing is one of the things that is different, but and other things are also all these little interactions between the neurons, or we call it experts actually in our in our, uh, in our work. Uh, all these interactions that are there and that are there, like enriching the baseline that neural networks would set up. And there are many differences and many details. And basically, what we are doing is we are thinking about these uh, new detailed rules that are, we are we are adding on top of the neural network baseline, and uh, trying to other properties that will allow it to learn gradually to be robust, stable over time, still being able to adapt and so on. So uh, when, like, I think that when people think that everything must be just neural networks, they are actually putting themselves into a little box and limiting their, mm -hmm. their way of thinking. So I would stop thinking, I would not even call it neural networks, yes or no, because I think uh, when you define something like this or when you use this in a discussion, it's, it limits also the understanding of the other other person. Okay. Um, hi, Mark. Are you a fan of TV show Westworld? Do you think machines have consciousness? What is your opinion about artificial or machine consciousness? Uh, so, I just know this Westworld, but I, I haven't seen it. And uh, uh, about the consciousness, uh, it's actually a funny question because in some uh, group of scientists uh, that we meet with sometimes, they have this like a C word. So for example, like, you know, in English you have like F word and like this, these things, and they have like C word and this is for consciousness. And there is also like Q word and that's for qualia, which is something, it's like this subjective feeling of something, you know, uh -huh. it's, the, some people call it qualia and they think it's something like mystical or, or not. And uh, something like this, uh, some people have for, for consciousness and uh, so, in some scientific circles, is actually like a bad thing to start talking about consciousness. But in some others, it's okay. And for example, we have one partner company from Tokyo, and they like their goal is actually not to build uh, AI, but to build consciousness, like artificial consciousness. And so they are looking on this from slightly different philosophy or perspective. But at the end, uh, what I think we all, we all are talking about is, is a system that can self-reference itself, you know, like, I think I'm not telling nothing uh, surprising that uh, this is what we think is uh, consciousness. And in certain ways, uh, the systems have some very limited consciousness even now. And uh, for example, one thing in, in our system, our architectures that but we are when, done... When it starts repairing its own code, basically, right? For, exactly. This depends on the capabilities. Or maybe it can be just about being able to sense your own thoughts. So mm -hmm. if we are thinking about neural network, like many neurons connected to each other, you can have another network that is observing what is happening in this network. And you can say that this is also some kind of consciousness, very limited, because it will not be able to maybe like uh, uh, interpret what is happening there or understand it and so on. But maybe if it will be like a uh, neural network with some better capabilities, you know, that we are trying to find, uh, it will be able to understand. and. Uh, uh, like related to this is uh, one different, uh, one other con concept that we are also working on. It's uh, meta learning or learning how to learn, and it's basically that when you have this 
a network of some experts that are communicating to each other. You want to have another one that is actually teaching this network here how to communicate more efficiently. And it's called meta learning because you are not using fixed learning algorithm, but you are actually learning some learning algorithms. So we are trying to discover how to discover other learning algorithms and make it more efficient and work more universal in, in more situations and so on. So you can also see this as some kind of consciousness because it's like once part of the system is referencing the other part and trying to make it better for, for any reason. I have one more question now. For, <laughs> uh, what do you think about the Fermi paradox? I think it's linked to the AI because, you know, if there was a different intelligent life somewhere in the universe, they would probably over time develop their own uh, AI, general AI or artificial super intelligence if it's possible and then we, sh we should know about it in some way. So are we just the first ones or what is your take on this? Uh, like I don't know to be honest and uh, this is also one of the reasons why we are building AGI so that we can use it to find answers to questions like this. And, but right now, I don't know, like, I think like, I can have some hypotheses, like, more crazy, less crazy, <laughs> but uh, it's just, just a hypothesis. And uh, I don't even want to say that I would like to like, go towards one of these directions, because like, at this moment, I have not enough data or like, not enough you know, things to, to prove something. So I think it's better to like, just stay and wait and see you know, uh, and get more data, like more proofs and so on. And uh, uh, maybe the answer would be like, I think that the universe is actually something that is quite different than what we think it is. This would be my answer. So maybe there is something, but we are not even capable of. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or like maybe the way we are like interpreting the universe or the time or like beginning of the universe and all these things, maybe it's just like, our current interpretation based on like our human minds and all these things. But uh, I think it will change. Like it changed in past centuries, you know, like people thought there is a God, people thought or there are gods and like many other things. And these worldviews, they always changed. Like uh, for some time people thought like it was totally reasonable to think that there is some God who is ruling our lives, you know, and if there is uh, like, I don't know, storm or something like this, there is Zeus doing these things. And in my opinion, it's quite logical. Like, if I didn't know science and didn't know these other things, I would just expect that there must be someone doing yeah, these you, things. You look for the most plausible explanation yeah. you can yeah. understand. Exactly. And now we have science, we have more information, so like we are stepping up and, uh, and so on. But I still think uh, it's, in a, it's not enough. Like, there are still too many unanswered things uh, in, in science that uh, answering question like this, I think it's, uh, it's impossible. It's like if I have to answer like what is, you know, in the next room, I just don't know because I don't have data about what is there. Yeah. And, and so for me, it's safer to say like, I just don't know what is in the other room than to start guessing what is in the other room. Okay. Um, I think we touched on the first one that AI might uh, you know, destroy the... Um, middle classes, so uh, I, I would skip that one if, if you want to discuss with Marek later, but I think we talked about that, about the society changes and... Maybe I will answer just one thing, because there was like a specific question about uh, the, this working class or like middle class and, uh, and making like super rich companies, and actually I think this will happen, uh, that uh, the universe has this property, this power law, that uh, some like small changes have huge consequences and this leads to like inequality. Like I think inequality is the most normal thing in this universe that like from a human perspective or for example for people who, who would like to have like equality between people it's a bad thing but for me it's like totally natural thing that uh, some things are big, some things are small. I think it's totally natural and it's just like our perspective to these things you know that's mm -hmm. like making it better or wrong. And so I think there will be super rich uh, companies and, uh, and so on. And, but the question is, of course, like if these people will want to, or these companies will want to share it also with the other people. I think that's the point. Not like if there will be or not will be, or like if it is good or bad, like if to share it. And so for example, 
our strategy, if, for example, good AI will become one of these companies, because maybe uh, if we develop the general AI, then my approach would be to actually share a huge part of what we have with the other people, just for the solidarity or something like this. I cannot guarantee this uh, for the other companies. I think it will be impossible to force them to do this. It's probably better to not start to do this, you know, if someone is super rich, so it's like better to let him be. But uh, I think this is uh, maybe the way how to uh, live in this like extremely unequal future is to start influencing these people before they become super rich. So maybe when they become super rich, they will want to share something back. Just like Bill Gates, you know, is having mm -hmm. all these uh, foundations and helping people and they have a group of billionaires in the US that is actually also doing all these things and so on. And not just them, like there are many people who are, uh, who are uh, altruistic or like you have even this, this new movement, uh, this effective altruism and mm -hmm. so on. So I would actually say like maybe better way is to influence these people and get some kind of seed to their head so that when they become or their companies will become super rich, they will actually want to uh, give something something back. Is it possible that once we become somehow humans connected to the AI, we'll become like more capable and we'll become equal because we'll have all the same system? I think there still will be inequalities even in this system. Like uh, uh, in any kind of network system, I think you will have these these differences. Like in some local area, something is you know, more powerful, something is less powerful, and so on. So I think there will be, like, even if I say, like, you will have super rich companies, I think that even between the super rich companies will be inequality. Like, there will be some super, super rich companies, and so on. So uh, it's just natural part of this universe. And uh, maybe, uh, like, really the question is that uh, if these people will want to share back, you know, something with the other people, and uh, maybe in that kind of future, uh, it will not be even such a huge issue because uh, let's say that there is enough energy and resources for everyone on this planet and like the solar system, that uh, maybe what we are missing right now is just the intelligence and some kind of effectiveness in exploiting all these things effectively. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's something that actually AI and automation of intelligence or like having like scaling the intelligence, like not being dependent on uh, just human intelligence and number of humans and the way that we need to educate people and so on. So basically making intelligence more, more abundant than it is right now can be the solution because right now we're actually bounded by the intelligence that there is a lot of resources, there is a lot of everything, but there is not enough people uh, uh, or like there is enough people, but uh, we are not, with our intelligence, we are not able to use these things effectively. Okay, so it sounds like uh, it won't matter that somebody is more rich or super rich than I am because we all have, you know, the basic resources and everything. It's not like today, you know, people live in poverty. So it, it is a big problem, but once it, you have this general, at least, uh, uh, level for everyone, then it, it, it shouldn't matter that much. Yes, yes, I think so. What, what is your hardware for AI? Is hardware actually something that is limiting you, or is, is, is this the side that you don't worry about at all? Uh, uh, we don't worry about this now because the models that we are testing are still quite small. So uh, actually, we have quite normal hardware, I would say that. Uh, like you can buy some better CPUs, better uh, GPUs, but nothing special. But, and actually I kind of surprised because I was expecting that we'll be uh, reaching some limits soon. But I think we'll like reach them quite soon and then we'll need to invest much more money to hardware actually quite soon. Okay. Um, so I'll do this in two questions. Are you using actually the, some, some stuff that you learned from the game development in, in developing AI? And if yes, then why do you think these approaches will work? So I wouldn't say that I'm using only uh, the stuff that I learned during uh, developing games or that it is related only to games. I would say that it's related to uh, how to solve problems, how to develop things, how to develop or how to engineer things fast, uh, that they are useful. 
and how to, for example, like be really practical that instead of trying to find some optimal solution for something that I will never find, you know, because it's impossible, I'm looking for some shortcuts, some approximations, how to get there fast uh, with certain threshold. And I think these are very useful skills. And uh, uh, even if I didn't get them from game development, I would probably get there from some other field. And, and I think they are useful. And uh, so it's... So it's like a basic set of skills that you can use, but it's not the only things that you use. Yes, yes. And of course, there are many other things that are game related that I cannot apply on AI, like game design, for example, and so on. And, uh, but uh, in AI, we actually take inspiration from all possible fields. So economy, uh, philosophy, I can say, uh, psychology, neuroscience, uh, uh, I said economy, of course, programming, computer science, machine learning, these neural networks, mathematics, or even physics, actually. And, uh, and biology. And biology, yeah, I forgot, one of the most important. And so I wouldn't be limiting myself only to just one field because there are very good patterns that you can kind of like analogically exploit and use in your field, also in these other things. And, and it's very, very useful to look for them and then use them if you want to get uh, forward uh, very fast. So uh, I think what I learned uh, during my life is way how to solve some problems practically and fast and efficiently, how to look for solutions and so on, and how to think or how to think about thinking. And I'm trying to use these skills, not just the game development skills. Okay. Um, actually, we are running pretty out of time. So uh, I suggest that uh, uh, you can ask the remaining questions. Marek is going to stay for a few minutes, maybe, I hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we will have some uh, pizza in the back. Uh, thank you guys for listening. And, and uh, we maybe if I can yes. just answer one question here, because I think it's very important. This uh, was there a time when you wanted to give up? OK. And that's a very good one. Yeah, actually, I think it's very, and it can be very useful for some people. And I would say, like, no, that's a single answer. But I think it's very, <laughs> very important to, to, to realize this. But have you ever thought about it? Uh, no. OK. Then I have one more. I, I read in one interview you finished, uh, you were saying that you are very surprised that there are so many startups, so many entrepreneurs, but you don't understand how so few people have very big dreams, like really, really big goals. Uh, I, I think that was very interesting, mm -hmm. like your goals, I think, are super impressive compared to the others. And uh, I think we should see more companies like this dreaming uh, really big. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, please a big round of applause to Marek. Mm -hmm. Thank you.